just want to welcome everyone back for uh, the third installment of our new Amplified uh, webinar series. Uh, I'm, I'm Todd McDevitt. I'm a senior investigator here at the Gladstone Institutes and a professor at UCSF. Um, for those who may just be joining us for the first time, uh, Amplified is a series that we that has been started um, to really emphasize or to focus on race and reality issues in STEM and to really give this the national platform uh, to speakers and discussion that this rightfully deserves right now. Um, and the intent of this, as many of you know, is to have candid conversations. Uh, and as part of that, we really want to encourage the to be as open and, and direct with questions uh, uh, during our discussion time in particular. Uh, this is really important. And we think that, again, we just wanna stress that, that you know people feel lower your guard or, or ask things, it's okay to not be perfect uh, with these. That's why we're having these conversations. It's a big part of this. Um, so we, as some of you may know, this has been launched this past year as uh, part of Gladstone's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. But really want to emphasize that this is a partnership, a national partnership that is formed uh, with the Molecular Engineering and Institutes uh, in, uh, at University of Washington, uh, Georgia Tech, and University of Texas at Austin. Um, we have uh, uh, intro, intro from a second from um, someone from, uh, from University of Washington representing that, and then also our speaker from University of Texas. Uh, so for reminder as well, this event is currently being live streamed on Facebook, and it, it's also being recorded. So if you're not catching this live, you will have a chance to watch this later, or if you really enjoy it and want to go back and rewatch, you'll be able to do that as well. So this will be available shortly after the event on Gladstone's YouTube channel. Um, reminder about the Q&A, please ask or submit questions anytime using the Q&A button or the chat. Um, you can submit these also on Facebook Live uh, via the chat, and our moderator will, or sorry, they'll, they'll funnel the, the, the questions to me at the end, and I'll try to get to as many of those as we can. Um, last, uh, last sort of housekeeping ones, um, just remember again, as I said, we don't need to be perfect here. This is also though we, we won't have the same ideas, but we want to just continue to respect each other, listen actively, listen respectfully. Um, but let's really, you know, get this out, get these things out on the table and really have a really, I hope, hopeful, uh, helpful discussion, which I know uh, Tyrone will definitely be able to help uh, stimulate in all of us today. So with that, I'm going to end my part. I just want to I'll end one last thing. This is a really special day for me. Uh, I want to just say on my part, you know, Tyrone is a big part of the reason that I went to University of Washington. Uh, he was a big part of recruiting. Uh, it was actually during the recruiting weekend that uh, when I visited that it was actually Tyrone taking me out and doing things that were abnormal as parts of the visit that was a big part of why I went there. <laughs> I think I seem to laugh, I think he remembers. It was, a, but it was, it was a big part of showing me what life was, could be like at University of Washington. And little did I know then that it was gonna stimulate the lifelong friendship that it has since then. Um, the other part that's really sweet for me today with this and watch is that uh, the other reason I, was, I went to University of Washington uh, and was an advocate or an advocate for it was Tyrone uh, was our uh, intro speaker today, which is Pat Staten. And Pat was my PhD advisor, uh, but he also played a really significant role in recruiting Tyrone uh, during a uh, year before I started grad school. So Pat, thank you for joining us. I'm gonna hand it over to you to do the intro. Thanks. Well, thanks, Todd. Uh, any professor would know what a pleasure it is to be here with two of my ex-students, uh, Todd and Tyrone. Uh, it's really a special thrill to get to work with students, uh, once you see them become such accomplished um, and impactful researchers and educators, and especially such great and caring people. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Meg McDevitt, um, the VP of Communications at Gladstone and really the leader of this series, putting it together, and she's family to me too. Um, and thanks to her team and Manu Platt as well, who's uh, our other committee member from Georgia Tech. So our uh, speaker today, Dr. Tyrone Porter, uh, is a professor of biomedical engineering at the University of Texas, Austin. Um, he received his bachelor's of science in electrical engineering at the wonderful HBCU Prairie View A&M University. Um, he received his PhD in bioengineering to our great and immense continuing pride at the University of Washington um, in 2003. Um, he started his academic career at uh, Boston University at the Department of Mechanical Engineering, uh, where he was promoted in uh, 2012 to associate professor with tenure. And he did really fabulous research there under his leadership 
the nanomedicine and medical acoustics laboratory made a lot of important contributions to this intersection of drug delivery and photoacoustics and ultrasound um, really ahead of their time, thanks to a lot of creativity, which has always marked uh, Tyrone's work and thinking. Um, currently, his goal is to push the application of ultrasound even further. He's doing a lot of cool work now in immunotherapy, uh, using ultrasound to help us traverse one of the, the great grand challenges left to drug delivery, the blood-brain barrier. Um, and as a result of all these impacts, he's received one of the, the top, uh, well, first he started with one of the great, the top fellowship, postdoctoral fellowship awards from the Photoacoustical Society of America. Um, and I remember that one. We were really proud of him to win that as a national award. Um, and later the R. Bruce Lindsay Award in 2008. And since then he has a real leadership role in the ASA. He was elected a fellow of the ASA in 2017 and serves on their executive council um, and member of the board of directors as well for the American Institute of Physics. So he's a very accomplished researcher, very creative. I always remember that and fearless in bringing together different disciplines. Today, we're here for a bigger reason though, um, and it's to address the injustice of racism and begin to discuss what actions we can take together. And somehow, as a second year assistant professor, I received my first URM and gender diversity grant, um, and it led me to Prairie View a and It was the first uh, HBCU I'd been reading. They had great biology and engineering programs, and so I, I thought I would go and visit. And Tyrone likes sports analogies, as you'll see. Um, and I always describe it as like a first year college coach visiting his first high school game to recruit and he finds Michael Jordan. And he decides to come to your school somehow. And that's how I've always thought of Tyrone is the ultimate superstar in research, but even more of a superstar as a person. You know, he was a living legend on our campus. He, everybody knew him. He impacted all of our diversity programs. Um, he was on the presidential search committee as a graduate student. Um, and he also led directly many of the protests against our anti-affirmative action initiative that passed during the time he was a student. Um, he led groups that occupied uh, offices at UW. He shut down the highways around UW, and there are many echoes of that I see today, but Tyrone had this in him even as a grad student. Um, when I saw his uh, defense room, it was one of the largest, I think the largest uh, conference room or lecture facility in the School of Medicine. And I, I introduced him at his PhD thesis. And when I walked up to the podium and I looked out, it was nearly completely full. And there was Tyrone sitting next to the Dean of Medicine uh, and the CEO of the $6 billion UW Medicine uh, chatting. And this is Tyrone, um, impactful, involved, and a superstar in every way. So I'm lucky now to have Tyrone as a friend. Sometimes it's like Jake from State Farm. He texts me at, we're texting back and forth at night and my partner is going, who are you texting? It's really late. Uh, he's my friend and he's my family too. So I hope you'll forgive my too long introduction. He's a superstar in every way, and he's a thought leader in racial diversity issues. And we're so lucky to have you here, Tyrone, and lucky to have you in our lives. So thank you. Thank you, Pat. Amen to that. All right, uh, thanks so much for the heartfelt introduction from both Todd and Pat. And it's, a, it's really truly a pleasure and an honor to participate in this uh, speaker series. I chuckled there just for a moment because my wife is actually sitting just uh, just to the side of me here. And when you mentioned Jake from State Farm, 
you know, we're tech because I'm three hours um, or two hours now ahead of you. So I'm texting you at like 11 p.m. And she's like, who in the world are you texting at 11 p.m.? Uh, 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 Jake, what are you wearing? What are you wearing? <laughs> so um, I, I totally, I, I really understand. Um, um, but I really appreciate the, the heartfelt introduction. So I want to, um, this is a topic, I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, this is a topic um, I'm gonna to touch on today that's really personal to me. Um, we have some personal introductions um, um, just on who I am. Uh, but this is a personal uh, a topic that I wanna share with everyone today. Um, and it, 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 I, I, I pull a lot of what I'm gonna share from you from personal experiences, but also just sort of personal awareness of my environment and also history. Um, historical treatment of, of Black Americans. So it's titled Cultural Tax, The Cost of Being the Only or the Few. It was really difficult for me to find uh, an image that actually captured that. So I just found this 3D animated character that's pushing the red ball up a hill just to, to suggest that there's always struggles to actually try to achieve your goals, particularly if the system is designed to actually hinder your advance. Um, and so it was really to encapsulate that what I'm going to share today is not really um, only only felt uh, the stresses only they're not only felt by by Black Americans but but also folks from the LGBTQ community as well as women um, so in some cases international students um, but there is a unique perspective uh, for being a, a Black American that I want to share with everyone um, and and that there's challenges and struggles that we face um, and and it's even worse for Black women. Um, my, my friend and colleague, Manu Plot mentioned this in, in, in his previous uh, presentation, that this is really, really difficult and challenging if you're a, a black female in the academy. Um, I'm gonna spend most of my time referring to my own experiences as a, as a black homosexual male. Um, he, him, his are the pronouns that I, that I use, um, cisgender. And um, so that's just based on my, from my own personal experiences. Uh, so I want to start off with just a couple of disclaimers, and these are not these are definitely not financial disclaimers. This is more personal disclaimers. This presentation is not based on critical race theory and is not an attempt to indoctrinate. So I want to make that very very clear. And it most certainly is American. Um, this presentation is 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 American as apple pie. So if you're here, if you're learning, um, if you're just trying to get more awareness. Um, that's actually, in my opinion, just what being a human being and being a, what, an American, what it's all about. So where do we start? Well, I want to start, to be honest, with the year 2020. This has been an unprecedented year, has um, really uh, seen unprecedented challenges, um, and, and people are living under, it seems like, constant stress. Started out, we're, we're, we're under siege biologically from um, a, a, a coronavirus, from a virus um, that spread across the world. There have been fires raging out west. Um, I think Colorado is actually experiencing its largest wildfires in history. And so there's a number of states out west that are under um, state emergencies that have declared emergencies right now. Um, and then there are hurricane. We're in historic hurricane season. I mean, they've run out of names, right? They're actually now using the Greek alphabet. And so I think there's a tropical storm that might have actually become a hurricane recently. That's, uh, I think, Hurricane Epsilon. And so we're just seeing a lot of things that are adding additional stress to most, most people's lives. And then on top of that, you're dealing with racial injustice. And I think the world was really awakened in a lot of ways, especially in America, uh, when George Floyd was mercilessly um, killed on camera. And that, that video went viral. And that led ultimately to the Black Lives Matter movement. And it's been a very broad coalition um, that has participated in these protests from city to city, city state to state um, across the country. And so that has also generated a lot of contention, a lot of animosity, a lot of frustration, a lot of anger that has really come out. And so I really think this year has, in my mind, has been very similar to a toddler that literally has been screaming in your ear for over an hour and just would not shut up. It will cause anyone to have an emotional and nervous breakdown, emotional crises. And I feel like this year has really kind of been been that way for a lot of people. So I give a lot of credit to uh, STEM and academia. They had a, a shutdown STEM activity June 10th earlier this year, and it was a moment of pause. It really felt like it was important for people to just kind of take a step back away from their work, 
away from their distractions and just sort of reflect, have conversation, dialogue, um, and just kind of share in the moment and learn from each other within the moment. And this was specific to uh, George Floyd's um, uh, killing or murder in, in, in Minnesota. And, um, but for a lot of people, uh, particularly white colleagues, um, there was, I think for many, there was an acknowledgement that systemic racism does exist. Uh, but for many STEM scholars um, who they were really, really unsure of what to do about it. And there were a lot of questions of what, how can we help? What should we do? How can we do better? Where do we go from here? Um, and I think first we need to really understand systemic racism and how it manifests itself in undue and disproportionate burdens on black students and scholars in STEM. We constantly hear this term white privilege. I really wanna kind of flip that and say that there's a lot of burdens, um, uh, sort of unique burdens to black scholars in STEM and, and also specifically that are in a lot of ways unique to STEM as well. I'm gonna demonstrate that or, or share that with you um, here today. So um, we first need to really get a good sense, wrap our head around. Um, so we're actually um, using similar vocabulary. What does systemic racism mean? Because um, you will hear people hear that term and then say, I'm not a racist. It's really talking about the system and the structural barriers that have been established and created. Um, and so systemic racism refers to laws, practices, and societal prejudices that support the advancement of one racial group or hindering the progress of another, uh, other racial groups. In America, systemic racism has established a racial hierarchy to the benefit of many white citizens. And that, that racial hierarchy is an important point. And also we just wanna uh, point out here that I specifically use the term here, many white citizens, because there are other white citizens that are, are really struggling um, as well, economically, financially um, during these hard times. So not everyone um, is living the, the, the glamorous life. So this racial hierarchy and the methods employed to justify and enforce the system places undue and disproportionate taxes or burdens on the oppressed racial groups. And so what are, um, this is all based on slavery and white supremacy. So we have to return back to the original sin, but this is not going to be a talk solely focused on slavery and white supremacy. It's the end products or the outgrowth of things as times have changed and, and America has sort of evolved over, over the years. So slavery was ratified by the 13th Amendment. Um, it was, it was uh, abolished by the ratification of 13th Amendment um, in 1865. But it's important to really acknowledge and recognize that this did not mean Blacks were treated as equals the very next day. Um, and to be honest, they weren't treated as equals for the next century. So if you, pay, uh, if you, if you take note of, of this date, 1865, uh, the Civil Rights Act was passed mid 1900s, mid 1960s. Um, so we're talking another hundred years um, that we have to really be aware of. Uh, so, so really quite opposite, um, the laws were passed that maintain a racial hierarchy within the United, United States. And in particular in the South, um, um, white supremacists sort of established the old sort of um, racial order and structure uh, rather quickly um, after the Reconstruction era. So we have to really go back to um, Plessy versus Ferguson. Um, as I would say, a really monumental court, Supreme Court decision that has really um, had disastrous, uh, had disastrous long-term consequences. And I want to really share with you what that, um, what that means. Um, so the decision was made in 1896. Um, Plessy was one eighth black. He challenged a Louisiana state law that said, um, blacks and whites would sit in separate cars. And so he went on to a railroad um, train and sat in the same cars as his white, his white peers and was arrested for that. And uh, he appealed the decision. He appealed um, the decision by the courts, um, which was made by John Ferguson. Um, and the Supreme Court ruled, ruled on this, um, his, his challenge and basically said or found, uh, voted eight to one at separate but equal facilities on interstate railroads was constitutional. I want to actually, um, most people don't read the majority or dissent opinions um, from the U.S. Supreme Court, um, but I took, I took a closer look at this just to kind of see what was written um, on this decision. Um, and Justice Henry Brown wrote as part of the majority, we consider the underlying fallacy of Plessy's argument that enforced separation of the two races stamps the colored race with a badge of inferiority. If this be so, it is not by reason of anything found in the act, but solely because the colored race chooses to put that construction upon it. 
In other words, it's not the act, it's not the fact that there's a law that says you need to sit in a separate car that um, stamps you with sort of inferiority. It's the fact that you think that you're now inferior, inferior because you have to sit in a separate car. And this is the biggest example of gaslighting that I have ever seen. This is gaslighting within the Supreme Court decision, right? And so this is gaslighting from a person that actually interprets our constitution and the laws by which we are governed as a nation. As a reminder, uh, what does gaslighting mean? Um, my friend Manu Plot presented on this earlier in the series. Uh, gaslighting is a form of manipulation that occurs in abusive relationships. It is an insidious and sometimes covert type of emotional abuse where the bully or abuser makes the target question their judgments and reality. And in short, it begins to, it sort of turns the victim into a person that um, is actually contributing to their own demise. And, 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 and it, it happens often enough, it can actually um, make you really question who you are and can actually drive you insane. So the Plessy v. Ferguson decision was made in 1896, but it had long-term consequences, particularly on racial relations within the United States. So the decision provided the legal, round, legal grounds for separate but equal in everything, um, restaurants, restrooms, um, railroad transportation, um, as well as education systems. But who decides what is equal? Certainly not black people who were just free from slavery um, within last, you know, prior to that decision, only 30 or 40 years prior. Uh, so who actually makes that decision? We're, black people at that point in time didn't own very much land. They didn't hold political office. Uh, they were disenfranchised on voter suppression. They were intimidated, uh, oftentimes terrorized. And so who actually decides what is equal? And it's predominantly going to be those who are in power at that point in time in history it was white Americans. So um, they separated, they separated students, they set up separate but um, considered equal schools, but they truly were unequal schools. And this is just an, a picture, an example of two schools in the early 1900s of kids that are sitting learning. And uh, one is crowded, uh, overcrowded. Um, it, uh, really uh, sort of exposed plumbing and piping, uh, learning materials not on the wall in one case, learning material, education materials on the walls in the other. Um, and it's, it seems like a much more delightful environment to actually learn and be educated. So poorly resourced schools in the black communities led to poor academic performance. But there's a, a long-term consequence associated with that. Um, and it basically conditions black and, blacks and whites to believe Black students were intellectually inferior to whites. Uh, even though schools have been des desegregated since that point in time, that sort of mindset and perception still persists today. That leads to um, stereotype threat. And I want to have um, just talk about this. This is one of the stresses that many Black um, scholars actually endure. Uh, so stereotype threat. Um, definition, the risk of confirming negative stereotypes about an individual's racial, ethnic, cultural, or gender group. You always kind of feel like you're being watched and you have to perform. And so the notorious RBG, rest, um, Mayor Soul, rest in peace, she mentioned this as a student, while she was a student at Harvard Law School, she felt like she was constantly being watched and that she had to excel um, in order to be accepted. And if she didn't excel, that that might actually confirm uh, the belief that women could not be successful in law school and definitely could not be successful at Harvard Law School. And so um, this academically then uh, puts an enormous amount of pressure on black students. And so there's pressure to excel in STEM majors at the risk of confirming that blacks are intellectually inferior. Um, and so my parents always told me that I had to work twice as hard as a white peer in order to get the same level of respect. Um, and there are opponents to, uh, uh, to DEI as well as affirmative action who often assume a person of color was offered a position only because of their race, only because of their skin color. Uh, as Manu has mentioned, that black privilege. Um, this devalues a person's ability and their intelligence and their creativity. Um, and only it, 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 it minimizes them to a single feature. Um, and this is something I have heard has been stated by me about me that I only actually got a faculty position because I was a diversity hire. I was only hired because I was black, um, paying no attention to my productivity and, 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 and the things that I had contributed uh, to, to the field. And so it, it's infuriating when you hear these kinds of things. 
There's also imposter syndrome. Um, this is a persistent feeling of inadequacy, excuse me, inadequacy and self-doubt despite evidence of success. No matter how successful you are, um, you might feel like you'll never really be accepted um, by a certain group. And so many Blacks have been conditioned to believe that they are not smart enough to excel in certain fields or even to aspire for certain degrees, um, an example of PhDs. Um, persons dealing with imposter syndrome are concerned that peers will recognize that they are a fraud and do not belong. So I don't know about many of you when you walk into a room to a scientific meeting for the first time, maybe it's the first scientific meeting that you've attended, um, even though you've been a scholar or a scientist for a number of years. But when I walk into a room, I do wonder if people are actually going to accept me. Are they actually going to think that I'm there only because I'm Black? I'm, I only, I'm a scholar and have been educated and trained only because I'm Black. I was offered admission into universities. Um, I was offered a position as a faculty member only because I'm Black. That does cross my mind. Whether it should or should not, it's basically the, the level of conditioning that we have experienced over the years that is always something that's on my mind. Particularly when I have heard people have made that statement about me, I've only got the position because I'm Black. And so it's always at the forefront of my mind. And so that in itself is, is a stress. This is a slide that I got from Ebony McGee, who also presented earlier um, in this series. And it just kind of lays out a variety of different stresses that people, um, Blacks, endure uh, in a racialized sort of environment. Um, and I point out just a few here in Black, but I, wanna, I wanted to um, move on to, to one that really impacts um, the success rates of Black students. Uh, and degree attainment, and that's the financial challenges and the financial struggles. And there also, once again, is a historical basis um, for these financial challenges. Um, back in the, the, well, it still um, persists to this day, but there's housing discrimination um, that, 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 that occurred. Uh, it, it was known as redlining. It still does occur to this day. Um, it's adapted a little bit, particularly when it comes to assessing or appraising home value. Um, but historically, banks only approved home loans to Black applicants for certain neighborhoods. And this is just a slide, uh, I believe, for the Atlanta area. You'll notice where uh, Atlanta's Black neighborhoods are located at and where the banks rarely lent money. And so there's this overlap um, to where Blacks are actually residing um, and is basically limited to where they actually could get, get home loans. So Blacks were living in these neighborhoods with lower home values. They were artificially suppressed home values. Uh, and it was not uncommon for, uh, for, for just based on these lower home values, uh, that would actually mean lower tax revenue for the county or the district and thus less resources um, for the school system. So if you notice, these things are sort of building on themselves. You have layer on top of layer, um, just building on, on itself. Um, that ultimately, ultimately can, can pose structural barriers to black scholar success. Uh, so for example, schools in these communities were less likely to have courses that would prepare them for uh, the, the students for STEM majors. So I grew up in Detroit, inner city. I went to the Detroit public schools. Um, there was no requirement for, fit for physics. If you're going to be an engineering or a, a physics major, you generally should take physics in high school to better prepare you for the curriculum. Um, there are very few AP calculus courses. There are very, very few AP chemistry courses. Just a handful of schools in Detroit actually offered them. Um, and that holds true for a lot of inner city um, schools, uh, and particularly in the neighborhoods where you have predominantly Black or predominantly persons of color, Latinx as well. Um, they just don't have the resources and the capacity to pay for these, um, for these um, teachers and the resources um, that are required um, for learning. This ultimately has led to a huge racial disparity in wealth, and this is generational wealth, right? And so if you look at this chart here, this is tracking it from the late 80s all the way up until 2016. Um, and we're talking consistently Blacks, uh, the wealth gap being on the factor of six to eight between Blacks and whites in the United States, right? And so this is, this is largely connected with home ownership because many Americans, um, most Americans are gonna actually generate wealth through home ownership and the appreciation, the appreciative value in their homes. If you are, confined to only buying homes in a particular neighborhood and the, depre the appreciation value is much slower than it is in other neighborhoods, it's gonna be really, really difficult and a challenge to actually generate wealth um, that you can then pass on to your offspring or leverage and utilize to pay for college. And so the American Institute of Physics 
uh, between 2018 and 2019 did a, a national study is known as the task force to elevate African American representation in undergraduate physics and astronomy, uh, known as team up, and they examined the reasons for the lack of African American success and degree attainment in physics and astronomy specifically, but I think a lot of what they learned could be applied also much more broadly to STEM fields, particularly in the biological and physical sciences and engineering. One of the major barriers that they identified to degree completion uh, was financial constraints. Students just really struggle to afford it. And, if, and, and there have been studies that have shown that black students generally on average have a larger um, loan burden uh, financial burden when they graduate. So they carry much more debt when they graduate um, and, 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 and complete their degrees. Uh, other factors also included um, inability to establish an identity within respective majors and an inhospitable and unwelcoming environment. Um, but the financial constraints was, was, was a huge um, factor in the challenge for many of the students. So this is a slide to show what that actually what kind of impact that actually has. This was a study that was done by a colleague here at UT Austin. Um, and to, they looked at um, um, different majors, different fields, uh, STEM, uh, business, humanities, and social sciences. Um, they looked at the, the rate of um, majoring and entering into college and, and selecting a particular major. And across the board, Blacks, Latinx, as well as um, white students, um, major in particular uh, fields at roughly the same rate. But then you look at the persistence. Um, to what extent do the students continue in that major and to what extent do they switch? Um, what percentage actually switch out? And it's much higher for black students compared to Latinx or white students, specifically in the STEM majors. And so we've got 58% of white students persist, 43% of Latin students, Latinx students persist, 34% of black students persist. So we're talking 66% of the students that start and major in the STEM discipline, STEM major, switch to another major or drop out of college altogether. You do not see this level of, or this disparity to this extent in the other, the other disciplines. Uh, the closest might be the social sciences and humanities, in fact, black students persist at a much higher rate than white students as well as Latinx students. And so this is something that is very specific to STEM, the STEM field and the STEM discipline. What does that mean? That leads to a much lower rate of degree completion um, and a severe uh, disparity between white students and black students. And um, it's even worse for American Indian Alaskan native students. I mean, they're completing their degrees at less than 1% um, in terms of degree attainment in the STEM fields. Um, I, I put this together um, based on data that was um, presented and reported by the National Science Foundation. I did remove um, psychology or social sciences from, um, from this data in this presentation. And that's just because there has been some gains uh, within the social, in, in those two disciplines um, in the scientific fields. Um, but if you remove those, then the, the, the uh, degree completion rates are, are, are either flatlined or slightly declining over the years for black students. Um, this also this then leads to uh, lower uh, employment rates, and so black students, uh, compared to um, the um, representation in the U.S. population, so in the U.S. population, blacks are on the order of 13, 14 percent, I think, roughly. Um, but employment-wise, um, we're only about in the STEM fields, um, uh, STEM and engineering occupations, we're only about five or six percent of the employees compared to. Um, um, and underrepresented minorities com and, uh, cumulatively are no more than about 12%. Even though the US population were in the order of about um, uh, underrepresented minorities, persons of color are on the order of about 28 or 29% of the population. This was from 2017 report. Uh, the lower graduation rates from with undergraduate degrees then leads to a disparity in STEM PhD um, completion. And so the rate for black students is lower than 5%. Um, and so, and once again, for a uh, um, American Indian Alaska Native, once again, is less than 1%. Compared to white the, um, PhD degree completion, you're talking above 70%. Um, 
PhDs then are, are basically the pool or the source for actually um, faculty. And so our faculty representation is also really low um, in the STEM fields. And so we're talking less than 3%. That's an important thing because one of the other, the factors I mentioned for the team up report, students having a sense of belonging and also establishing an identity, they tend to do much better if there's a, a black faculty member in their department because they have somebody they feel like they can actually connect with, someone who can serve as an ambassador or a role model someone who they who can basically aspire them to complete their degrees but if we're if we're if we're absent more or less within um within faculty representation at these universities it makes it really 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 difficult i also want to point out one more thing before i move on in terms of these degree completion especially for uh, the undergraduate level this does include historically black colleges and universities if you take that out this number actually goes is, is even worse right and so it probably drops to below three percent So the, the stresses that are associated with that then are isolation. I mean, many of these students, many, many of the employees feel isolated. They feel alone. Um, they feel like they have nobody to talk with, talk to, um, and, and, and share, uh, have some sort of commonality um, within the workplace or within the academic environment. So that in itself poses a, a huge burden um, on, the, on, on, on persons of color, in particular for Black, um, black students, Black scholars. Uh, for the black scholars then those who are professionals those who are faculty members that leads to what's known as invisible work uh, this is a term that also has been associated with cultural tax cultural taxation um, but i want to i want to spell that out a little bit more for for the audience so what exactly does invisible work mean um, so it's work that's not directly related to their job or the academic program that often is not acknowledged or considered during uh, performance review and so many of my black colleagues will talk about having uh, to mentor younger uh, colleagues and or students, uh, recruit persons of color on behalf of the institution, go into uh, career fairs or graduate school fairs. Um, they're the target to underrepresented minorities, uh, serve on and often lead DNI committees, take numerous photos to show that the institution is actually diverse. I took many pictures for the University of Washington, um, raise awareness on racial and, and social inequities, and lastly, serving as a change agent for multiple organizations. Um, so since I've been a student, I've actually done this kind of work. I've been involved as, as, as Pat had mentioned in this intro. Uh, I've been involved on, on, in DNI work um, because it's just, it was important to me. Um, it, it's part of my DNA. I'm, I'm passionate about it. Um, but I do, I do quite a bit. I've, I've, I've done things for the university. I've done things for professional societies, professional organizations. Um, I'm proud of the things that I've done, um, but oftentimes it does go unacknowledged. And it's difficult when there also is just sort of a lack of resources and a lack of support. And so that makes it even much more difficult and more, much more um, challenging uh, for black scholars. So the last thing that I wanna to touch on is something that um, I'm gonna walk through slowly um, because, um, because it's really difficult um, to really, for me to digest. And this is racial injustice. And I'm, I'm referring to this with regards to the criminalization of, of Blacks in America and the police brutality that they've had to endure for so many years. So criminalization of Black Americans. Passage of multiple draconian federal laws for nonviolent drug offenses has disproportionately targeted Black Americans. Many of us don't really know what that is. Um, it, it, it ultimately has led to mass incarceration, but many of us don't know other than maybe the 94 crime bill are not really aware of how long this has existed in our justice system and the laws that have been passed by the federal government. So the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986 established a 100, 100 to 1 ratio between powder and crack cocaine for sentencing policy, right? So one gram of crack cocaine, which could easily fit in your pocket, compared to 100 grams of powder cocaine, which is probably going to require a bag or a briefcase in order to carry. Okay, I want to paint that picture for you. Where do you think police are going to be dispatched? Where do you think their presence is going to be uh, much heavier? In addition to that, there's mandatory minimum, minimum sentencing for drug convictions, convictions uh, for something as, as minor as drug possession. Once again, this is a federal law. 
And so you'll notice on this curve here, that law was passed in 1986. You'll start to see a steep rise in incarceration rates. We've all now been reminded of the 1994 crime bill given that Vice, uh, Vice President Biden is running for president of the United States. And he was supportive of the 1994 crime bill. That was the three strikes bill. And so if you were um, found guilty of a crime three times, you had a mandatory life sentence. And so now you got black, you have individuals going to prison for the remainder of their natural long life. And so once again, you start to see a continuation of the steep rise in the incarceration rates. Now I'll mention that this is disproportionately affected blacks. Person can ask, do you have data to support that? Here you go. Once again, representation of the US population, people in state prison for drug offenses, people in federal prison for drug offenses. Because remember, this is passed by Congress and signed by the president, these laws. And so you go to federal prison. You got much higher incarceration numbers and percentage of the prison population for Blacks and Latinx, so basically persons of color compared to white, even though we're a much smaller percentage of the US population. In addition to these draconian federal laws, um, excuse me, uh, before I move on to that point that I wanna make, I just wanna show the incarceration rate is much higher on the order of six times higher for Blacks compared to white citizens. And this is from 20, uh, 2010. So in addition to these draconian laws, you have to justify these laws. You have to make people feel like they're gonna be effective, that they're, 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 they're warranted, they're needed. And during this period of mass incarceration, you had an explosion, uh, proliferation uh, of these uh, uh, television shows that sensationalized police chases and arrests. And these shows disproportionately feature persons of color as the suspect. So bigger question, what does that have to do with me? What does that have to do with STEM? My wife actually, when I was sharing with her some of the things that I wanted to share with you today, she actually asked me that question specifically. What is this criminalization of Blacks, given that I'm not a criminal? I've actually never been convicted. I've never been handcuffed. So what does this actually have to do with me? What does it have to do with STEM? So I wanna tell just a little bit of a story. Summer 1990, had a summer internship at Dow chemical uh, and actually at their headquarters, which is in Midland, Michigan. I'm a high school student. Most of my friends were working for McDonald's flipping burgers or uh, were working at the mall um, selling guest jeans. And so I had this real opportunity that uh, presented itself that, um, you know, in my opinion was, was very unique. So the first, the first day that we arrived, and there's a group of us, I'm not by myself. There's uh, other black kids from Detroit. Um, and there's also other black kids from Flint, uh, high school in Flint. So we arrive. First thing you do when you first arrive in a new town, new city, you got to go buy groceries. And so we go to the grocery store. And there's probably about 15 or 20 of us that end up going to the grocery store. We also had uh, mentors. We had sort of guardians. Um, they were um, undergraduate students, um, black undergraduate students at uh, Big Ten schools. Go to the grocery store, gro grocery store, and we're walking around shopping, buying our goods. We check out, pay our money. Before we exit, there's a police officer waiting for us. And he asked to see our receipts. Someone had called and reported that there was suspicion of theft from black consumers walking around in the store, right? High school student thinking of the, this is gonna be a great opportunity. First day of arriving in Midland, Michigan, first day. Right, so this is all due to racial profiling. You have all of this uh, propaganda that is framing blacks, particularly particularly black males, as being criminals. In addition to the mass incarceration rate, the people just are beginning to be conditioned to view and see blacks as being criminals and blacks as being suspicious. That didn't end up as being violent or dangerous for me. A police officer let us go, saw the receipts left us feeling embarrassed and dehumanized when we left the store, but it wasn't violent. So let's give some examples where it actually does turn violent. Trayvon Martin, killed February 26, 2012, walking back to his father's fiance's house, was killed by George Zimmerman, uh, who claimed that Trayvon looked suspicious because he was wearing a hoodie. Zimmerman was acquitted of all charges. I wanna make sure that that point 
is very clear to everyone watching this. He was acquitted of all charges based on stand your ground. He was defending himself. Ahmaud Arbery killed February 20th, 2020, while out jogging by three white men. Arrests were made on May 7th, right? So we're talking three months later, only after video of the assassination went viral on social media. If that video was never released, would those three men actually have been arrested? Who knows? I want to say, well, you know, that was, um, you know, racial profiling. These were bad seeds in their community, community. You know, that wouldn't actually happen beyond, beyond that, right? Let's give some other senseless killings only in 2020. Only in 2020. Breonna Taylor was killed in her sleep March 13th by police acting on a no-knock warrant. Suspect was already in custody. Police claimed to be acting in self-defense. Her boyfriend did fire off some rounds, um, but they were not charged with Brianna's murder. We all are seeing that work play itself out right now um, on the media. George Floyd killed, was killed on May 25th, right? So just a couple of months, couple of months later, by a police officer who knelt on his neck and back for almost nine minutes while other officers watched, watched as spectators, was suspected of passing counterfeit bills. On June 12th, Rashard Brooks was approached by police after falling asleep at the wheel in the Wendy's drive through lane in Atlanta, in Metro Atlanta. He was shot and killed uh, while resisting arrest for failing a sobriety test, but did not pose a lethal threat to the police. Persons in their sleep, killed in their sleep. Person killed after being suspected of passing counterfeit bills. These are not violent crimes. These are not violent acts. And person killed after being pulled over uh, for falling asleep at the wheel in the drive through lane at the Wendy's, right? Now, many will say, well, Rayshard Brooks, he actually did resist arrest. He was very physical. He pointed a taser at the cops. I mean, we hear these things, right? From pundits, media pundits that are out there. Okay, let me give you a, another final, I think final example that really I hope hits home. This is more recent. Jonathan Price was killed October 3rd by a police officer after, after attempting to break up an argument, right? Between a man and a woman uh, at a convenience store. Witnesses state Price did not pose a threat to anybody. And in fact, while he was breaking up the fight and the disagreement, he was assaulted by the gentleman and didn't fight back. Police arrived on the scene, raises his hands, hasn't done anything wrong, feels like there's no need to detain him, so he turns around and begins to walk away. He is tased and shot. Now, why in the world would police think a black man who has already said that he has not been involved in the argument, does not pose a threat to anybody else on the premises, walks away in a non-threatening manner, but still gets tased and killed on the spot. You decide. So this has led um, to a lot of frustration, anger. I like to, I, I call it an emotional text. And I like to liken it just to provide some context. I liken it to learning that a family relative your mother or your father has passed away on the same day that you discovered that your spouse or partner was cheating on you. There's loss, there's anger, there's frustration, there's confusion. There's a emotional trauma that you and distress that you're actually enduring. And so Doc Rivers captured and encapsulated this as best, better than I possibly could ever do. And I just want to play this. This was during an interview after, didn't die, but after Jacob Blake was shot multiple times in the back in Wisconsin. And so this was um, his response. All you hear Donald Trump and all of them talking about fear. We're the ones getting killed. We're the ones getting shot. Uh, we're the ones that we're denied to live in certain communities. Um, We've been hung, we've been shot, and all you do is keep hearing about fear. It's, 
It's amazing to me why we keep loving this country and this country does not love us back. And it's just, it's really so sad. Like I should just be a coach. And it's so often reminded of my color. You know, it's just really sad. We gotta do better. Uh, but we gotta demand better. Like we got, you know, it's, it's funny. We protest and they send riot guards, right? Uh, they send people in riot outfits. They go to Michigan with guns and they're spitting on cops and nothing happens. The training has to change in the police force. The unions have to be taken down in the police force. My dad was a cop. I believe in good cops. We're not trying to defund the police and take all their money away. We're trying to get them to protect us, just like they protect everybody else. Uh, I didn't want to talk about it before the game because it's so hard, like just keep watching it. That video, if, if you watch that video, you don't need to be black to be outraged. You don't, you need to be American and outraged. And how dare the Republicans talk about fear? We're the ones that need to be scared. We're the ones having to talk every, to every black child. What white father has to give his son a talk about being careful if you get pulled over? It's, it's just ridiculous. And it just keeps getting, it keeps going. Uh, there's no charges. Rihanna Taylor, no charges, nothing. All we're asking is you live up to the Constitution. That's all we're asking for everybody, for everyone. Thank you. That is all we're asking. And his comment because my wife and I have two sons. And what white father has to tell their child, their sons, to be careful when they get pulled over by the police? That it, it whether it is just a couple of bad apples. If it happens throughout history, that means that the tree is rotten to the core. So as Doc Rivers said, I should just be a coach. I should just be a professor. I should just be a scholar. Teaching students how to be scholars. How to be STEM, how to be STEM scholars. We should all just be STEM scholars. If we lived up to the Constitution and the ideas presented in the Constitution, equal protection under the law, meaning not being denied equal access to resources, equal access to opportunities, equal access under the law, then I could just be a professor. He could just be a coach. We could all just be STEM scholars. But we are also Americans, we're also human beings, and we should all be outraged by these atrocities. And so what does it have to do with me? What does it have to do with STEM? When I see these things and they happen constantly, continuously through the years, and, and, and you, you, you can't, as a black person, you can't ignore it. But this was a, 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 a tweet um, that I, I borrowed from Manu Plot and it was part of his presentation. Being black is having a good day and then seeing another black person killed for no reason. Then you have to think about it, talk about it for most of the day or don't and numb yourself. You literally have to swallow it and suppress the pain and the frustration and the anger and act as if nothing has happened. It's a constant emotional war. How is anybody supposed to deal with that pain, anger, frustration and be productive at work? 
productive at school? How was anyone supposed to pay attention? So that racial injustice leads to emotional attacks or emotional trauma um, and emotional pain, a lot of scars that we have to bear. That once again is unique to, in my opinion, is unique to black, black people in this country. So what can we do? Because it's, it's a lot to swallow and it's a lot to think about. First and foremost, I give a lot of praise and acknowledgement to Gladstone, the Gladstone Institutes for having these conversations. We need to continue to have these conversations with our, within our respective institutions. We need to increase awareness of racial disparities in generational wealth, housing, educational attainment, policing. And a lot of people will say, well, you know, where do I start? There's too much that's out there. Read one article or one, one, watch one TED talk each month. There are numerous TED talks that are out there um, that one could, could tune into that are on YouTube or just read one article, something from Inside Higher Education, uh, for example. Um, they're discussed, the, the material and the content is out there. You don't have to drown yourself consuming the material. You can do it slowly, drip, drip, drip. So those with the credentials and the opportunity join an advisory board for an, an academic institution, a chamber of commerce, because you need to hold people accountable. You need to hold the system accountable. And unless someone is actually there that's paying attention to these things, then the system will continue to operate the way it was always designed and you always get the same result. Have conversations on how your institution can be more welcoming and more hospitable. The last, I think the last comment that I want to make here is call people in rather than calling them out. This is from a colleague of mine here at University of Texas, uh, Scholar Walks. Um, she mentioned this at a, you know, previously she presented at uh, College of Engineering here uh, about the idea of calling people in, uh, not putting them on the defensive. If you point out anything that they have said that's been biased or is, is bigoted, hypocritical, calling them in to actually recognize it um, and have a conversation about how it makes someone feel or how it is destructive or corrosive to, um, to the values of and, and, and the motivations to make the place more, much more equitable and inclusive. So calling people in, I, I think is, 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 is something that's gonna be really important moving forward. So that's the end of my talk. Um, I wanted to leave time for questions. I wanted to have open dialogue on this topic because I think it's extremely important for us to discuss these things and not just only sit and listen. So with that, um, I think Todd is going to manage the question and answer period. Thank you, Tyrone. It was just a, know how difficult it is and just really appreciate you uh, sharing so openly and challenging us in, in the way that you do. I really appreciate it. Um, there's a lot of questions are coming in, which is great. <laughs> uh, I've been trying to take some notes and, and not prioritize, but condense some of these. Um, several that came in at the end was, was I think touching your final slides. What are concrete ideas? I think myself included, it's always uh, looking and, and re-looking at what can we be doing? What are we not doing? And what are, what are the things? Because we have not had the same life experience in those ways. And so the education from it, and so that we can put ourselves in that place perspective and understand. And so give the list of concrete things that you gave, I think is fantastic. I think it's something we should probably include as a, a permanent thing on one of the websites or something like that. Just again, almost like a fact page of things to help remind people and get get the, the wheels turning. Um, so I, I apologize for those, I'm skipping over for those who asked similar ones about what can we do, what can we do, which is great. Um, I'm gonna go to a couple of the other ones, I think in this first and no particular, no necessarily order of these, but um, some of the ones that came, came out. One of these that came in early, I, I, I think is a good one is, uh, you know, conversations like this today and, and all of us want, that are here are part of it, there, there's another faction of people that are not here today that are not part of the conversation. And this question that then comes up is there's, a, there's an element of preaching to the choir of a self-selected group. And the question is what, do, what to do about it, all of us, not just, you know, single ones. And so I think that with that, you know, effective strategies to engage, educate those who aren't interested, or, and I won't say not interested, I'm trying to choose the word properly. I could say not participating, but they might have a conflict today or something like that. So those those folks that are not part of our conversation, what can we do as a community? What can we be doing um, in your opinion, you know, 
to try and, and engage them. So that that's one of the reasons why I mentioned um, serving on a, an external advisory board, uh, Chamber of Commerce, because um, I'm on the board of directors for AIP, um, because you can, that's an umbrella organization. And so you can help us sort of advocate, you can help sort of steer and guide um, in particular resources or initiatives or best practices. You can share that and then the, um, within the umbrella group that can hopefully then be disseminated out to the membership. Um, so I think that that's, that's, I thought about that quite a bit um, before, before uh, speaking today because it, it, it is true. There is an element of preaching to the choir. I suspect a lot of people are aware of many of the, of the things that I shared today Maybe not the connections um, um, between the stresses and the moments in history um, and the web um, that's sort of created, but I suspect most people are aware. Um, so I think serving on those boards is, is one of the first things that I could suggest. The other one is I, I, I give praise once again to the Gladstone Institutes because they are making this series available on YouTube. For many institutions, many units, they're having these conversations, they're having people come and present, but then they're not made publicly available. And so sharing that information more broadly and uh, making it more publicly available, I think is gonna be absolutely critical and key. That's, that's great and easy to do, in my opinion, at least. Um, one of the think, just, but not everybody does it. I No, I, like you said, the, data, the evidence is there that it's not, you're absolutely right. Um, this one just came in, but it's one I think that I, I that popped out to me a bit. So I want to I want to do it, and I'll go back to the ones I was keeping track of. Um, because I think this is coming from a perhaps a, a student or a trainee. How do you go about being proud of the representation you bring to STEM and being a, a BIPOC for those who don't know the the acronym uh, scientist without feeling like a token student employee or a BIPOC that is a scientist rather than a BIPOC scientist? And I know you touched on this, but I think this is a great question. Yeah, so the tokenism is, is a real one. Um, and, and so it, 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 it's, it's because our numbers are so small and slim, it's hard to avoid, it really is. Um, and so what I, what I generally do um, is I communicate and reach out to those who, in my opinion, are highly respected within the organization. So I'll give, he may not, I don't know if he'll be happy or be even aware that I'm gonna share his name. I mean, Pat Staten is one example, but there's another one, uh, Jody Simone, who's now at Stanford. Um, I, I hold him in high regard. Most people within chemistry, chemical engineering, uh, pharmacal engineering hold him in high regard. But I reach, I, I, I purposefully make connections with him. Bob Langer, the same thing. I purposefully reached out to make connections with them because then you start to get people who are in positions of influence that begin to understand your position, the things that you're dealing with and struggling with, and in many cases can advocate for you, even behind closed doors. And so I do kind of work to try to find people who are very influential who could be advocates for me and some of the values that I have in rooms that I may not even be present in. And, and so it, it, it can take away some of the front of feeling like a token. Um, in addition to that, my wife has actually given me another really good, um, really good point, and that's to find someone else um, to participate. Um, that's like you to bring them to the table. Um, and and that, that requires recruitment, that requires um, networking. And so networking to find like-minded individuals is also important. Let me ask one follow up on the one because it's stimulated. I, you know, because I've known you and, and Pat used the word fearless and you are in many ways. And so, you know, you've had, you have no problem uh, reaching out to a Bob Langer or Joe DeSimone, introducing yourself. Up. You know, many trainees are perhaps a little bit more timid, timid. And if you were speaking to those, you know, not to push them too far outside their comfort, what from your experience has been ways to say, what are the effective ways to engage with folks like that and ways that they can use as that strategy? Because for them, the, the very simple, the, the first reaching out might be, you know, what they're concerned or scared about or, you know, because they don't know that person or they don't know them well enough or something like that. No, that, that's, that's a good point. Um, so you never know until you try. Um, and I, I think 
you have to you have to make the effort. You have to put yourself out there. And you'll be surprised, I think in many cases, has everyone that I have reached out to been very receptive? No, they have not. Um, I gave a number of cases today where they absolutely were. And when they are receptive, they can be some of the most impactful, influential conversations that you can actually have. And it can ultimately work both ways. So I think a lot of the conversations that I had with, for example, Jody Simone early on was very, he was sharing and educating and helping and benefiting me. I feel like over the years that has sort of flipped or reached sort of an equal playing field where our conversations are now, he's learning from me, I'm learning from him, both in terms of science, but also in terms of social issues. And so we, we sort of resonate. Um, and, and, and you, you establish friendships that way. So, you know, we were, you were talking about basketball or you were talking about uh, Pat was sports earlier. I, I will text Jody Simone about UNC basketball or UNC football um, during the season and, and he'll respond. You had, to, you had to bring up UNC just to rub it into this. I did set. have to bring up UNC. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, another one just came in here that, that at least with, with with me personally, and I and I knowing this person as well, can see where it's coming from. King George from George, Texas asking, uh, what kind of steps can lab heads take to reduce this burden for underrepresented minority students in our labs? Hmm. So, yeah, that, so I will say acknowledging um, if they're passionate about um, being involved, I think it's important to from time to time to just check in with them to see how they're doing. But also, I think being supportive. So Pat Staten was very supportive for the things that I did while I was at University of Washington. My primary PhD advisor was Larry Crum. Uh, I remember I asked him to I, I told him I wanted to take a trip to, to Africa. I was going to Ghana, West Africa. And he said, you know, I'm not, and he was, we, we had a very, I think also establishing a very genuine open dialogue and conversation, right? Um, being transparent with your students is also gonna be helpful. So he told me, you know, I, I'm not black. I can't understand the desire to go back to Africa. I see it, I know people want to do it. But I think if it's important to you, it's important to me. And he told me that. Um, and it was it was a very um, eye opening experience for me making that trip and making that voyage. And it was something I felt like I had to do. But he never deterred me from doing those kinds of things, being involved in a variety of non academic, non scientific activities on campus. He would just check in, um, and the checking in part is really important. <laughs> That, that yeah sometimes not overthinking it and just like you said just lowering that bar for conversation discussion approaching it that way and just and just, and just and just listening um he he predominantly listened um pat uh, i will say also predominantly listened paul yeager predominantly listened they weren't actually trying to help me solve anything they just it was just an opportunity to just hear what what i was going through and dealing with yep. um Another one just came in that I, I like this is uh, as a white graduate student on their department's recruitment committee at a predominantly white university. Are there ways to make the program more welcoming to black students and students of color? Yeah, I, I've only been at UT Austin for a couple of months and, and actually a, a white student. And I don't know if it's the same student is actually asking this question right now. <laughs> it very well could be. It's anonymous, so I can't tell you this one. <laughs> he, he uh, a student asked me that very same question, and it is a it is not an easy one to answer. Um, the suggestion that I would make is actually the suggestion that Manu made, um, and it was something that was done for my recruitment. I think the 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 powers that be need to figure out how to surround the black or students of color that come to the university for a visit. They need to figure out ways to make as many contact points with other students of color as possible. And so Scott Minix was in that kind of role. Uh, Pat, you probably remember Scott. He's actually now in Dallas, Texas. I just, I just talked with him right before we moved here. Um, but he played that role. So when I came from my visit to University of Washington, he made sure that there was a black student that was taking me from one meeting to the next. 
He made sure that I sat and had lunch with black students. And we sometimes think that um, we separate ourselves not only based off of um, our identity, uh, racial and ethnic identities, but also our level of education. So you typically will see graduate students are separated from undergraduate students, which I think is just ridiculous. Particularly as an, if you identify as a black student, a queer student, um, a female, I think collectively there's strength in numbers. So, so Scott would make sure that I made connections with not only the graduate students that were black, but also the undergraduate students that were black and a couple of faculty members that were black. And so it was a holistic approach. So for the white student, I would make that recommendation and that is actually being an ally. If the white student is making this recommendation to the department chair or to the dean of the college that we got these students coming in, why don't we try to figure out how to collectively increase their connection and contact with other students of color or faculty of color at the university? And one that related to that, another one came in, I actually had a, a note from an earlier one that was along these lines too, is, um, you know, if, if the there's a clear intent on behalf of many uh, universities, departments, industry, I think as well, you know, to increase ranks of people of color, LGBTQ, women, all the groups, all various different, different demographics that you just referred to. Um, question is, don't we have to purposely seek them out? So I think that this is, this has been sort of this passive and the, the, the excuse that has been, oh, well, there's the pool is small or we, you know, not can identify the, the things that tend to push it down the road a bit, even addressing some of these issues or trying to do something more acute to uh, um, improve, obviously from the, the statistics, I would hate to jinx or say they can't get much worse, but they, they you know, the, there's a, a ample room for improvement in those. So, yeah. <laughs> so what, what would you say in terms of like, um, or your opinion or thoughts on, you know, both that, that sentiment, but also more again, in the actively, what can we be doing? Or, you know, looking under, looking in places that have not changing practices, I think being the main, what are the practices that need to be changed in the, from the beginning of these processes in terms of recruitment and, and such, I guess. So there, there, there's two suggestions that I want to make here. Um, the first one is get in the game. It's similar to if you're going to learn a new language, the best way to do that is just immerse yourself within that culture, right? So if you want to learn Spanish, go over to Spain and stay over in Spain for like a month. So I give a lot of credit. I give a lot of praise. A lot of my peers and colleagues have heard me tell this story numerous times. Pat mentioned it earlier. Pat actually came down to Purdue A&M University from Seattle. This is not exactly across the street, okay? This is a, at least a four and a half hour flight plus an hour and a half drive from the closest airport. If you wanna talk about intentionality, that is being intentional on trying to establish a connection, a true connection. So either go to, you know, and many of my colleagues who are faculty members, I have to call them in here. Many of us will say that there's a staff member that does that, or there's an assistant dean or associate dean for diversity or somebody on staff at Glassstone, maybe for, for example, or like a national laboratory. And that's what they do, right? As if it's, there's a problem, like it's territorial. It's a systemic problem. It can't be solved by a handful of people. So you have to be involved, you have to get in the game. So, you know, attending conferences like National Society of Black Engineers or National Society of Black Physicists or Nobache, um, the Institute for Teaching and Mentoring actually has an annual conference, which is predominantly populated by PhDs and postdocs. You're looking for potential black faculty and it's all black. Um, SHIP, going to a SHIP meeting or ACES, which is American, in, in, uh, American Indian Science and Engineering Society. So going to these meetings and not just being faculty that's going to depend upon other people to bring the prospective candidates to me so I can evaluate, but true, go act and, and proactively recruit them. The second comment um, was actually mentioned in a, a, a Inside Higher Education article that just came out today. Monica Ford did it to me this morning. It, it, it's around the same idea that Pat has been, Pat Mondu, you and I, um, and uh, Elizabeth Nance at University, a few other folks have been discussing, and that's building consortium. Mm -hmm. And one of the comments or points that was made in the article is that people are trying to improve their numbers working as individual institutions to once again address a systemic institutionalized problem. 
And it's because you want return on investment or return on, you know, uh, you want to have yield. So you want to look at seeing your individual numbers go up. But if you work collectively, once again, it goes around this whole cluster idea. If you work collectively, you can try to identify a large pool. And I think ultimately everyone is going to win if that, in, that large pool is in the same room, in the same space at the same time. Because they're going to feel like they belong, they're valued. They're going to see all of the universities that are basically saying, we want you. And ultimately, it's going to improve upon the relationships, I think, ultimately in the end. So working collectively rather than continuing, continuing, continuing excuse me, to work individually, which is not, is not in, our, in the DNA of universities. It's just not how we operate right. historically. But we got to get past that. And I think that's the only way that we're really going to have, I would say, not only incremental improvement, but significant improvement. Let me ask one follow-up on that because I'm thinking about it live. Is um, in, in part with some of this, it's you know, you said some of that can can come from. I don't want to pick on all administration with that. Different jobs and roles, there's a competitiveness to it and beating your peers and promotions and stuff like. That. So, part of it is you said a uh, certain type of leadership, and sometimes a leadership may or may not be in place or buy in with those. And so I think. Not saying it's all, but I'm just saying I can see, I've seen examples, unfortunately, where it's where, like you said, the, the collective broader interest in that. Um, so I guess part of it is what, you know, as academics, at least in these, oftentimes we do enjoy certain uh, freedoms intellectually that we, we can go out and do and, um, and use with that. But I guess in terms of that, I guess yeah, think about it as, you know, what can we do for educating the leadership as well with what you just said. This isn't the benefit of all, and therefore a consortium of broader effort is only a, a, a win in the bigger picture. It will, it will pay dividends down the road kind of thing by, by foregoing trying to be you know, too independent, too individual, I guess, on the front end. Yeah, so in response to that is, you know, you, you, in my opinion, you need folks or people like Pat, you need people like uh, Manu, myself, um, you need full professors, people who are um, uh, highly respected and regarded, um, and also have gotten to a point of, of excellence and sort of, I will say credentials. It was on my last slide. You have the credentials to assume these kind of leadership positions or positions of influence. Um, you, have to, you have to step up and, and either take on the mantle of being an administrator or a leader, or have conversations with the dean. I will, I, I had consistent dialogue with Dean Luchin at Boston University. I had consistent dialogue with the associate provost, Daniel Kleinman, when I was at Boston University. And I'm working to establish those connections and dialogue here at University of Texas. Now, you mentioned earlier, I'm fearless. I, I was doing that when I was a graduate student. I was going to the Board of Regents meetings. I was, I had a relationship with the provost of the university, the president of the university. But that's just because I just went to the office. I scheduled a meeting and let them know what my grievances are. They're, especially at state institutions, they're public officials. It's actually their, their job to meet with a student. It's their job to meet with a faculty member, right? So I think, I think it's, it's, it's up to, in a lot of ways, it's up to people uh, and very constructive. So the, the last thing comment that I'll make on this is that people, and this is what I have learned from my own experiences, people are more receptive to he hearing people complain if they have a suggestion for a solution. Mm -hmm. So I never went to these meetings without offering, making some sort of a peace offering or basically making a suggestion, right? Just one. And that at least will get the wheels turning. And that tends to be productive. If you go in and it's just complain, 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 uh, they tend to get much more defensive and go into their turtle shell. Yep. yep. What, one other one, we're gonna have to wrap up here shortly, but this I'm having too much fun with this, so I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one of the ones that came in with this that also uh, speaks to the current situation. A lot of the examples you gave, I think two questions ago about what can we do? And, and you said being intentional and visiting this stuff. Right now, and for the near term, it's not permanent, hopefully with this, but but for the near term, we're under we're under different conditions. So great question came in from uh, Brianna Banalis. What are some of the best methods to connect and support and, and with our minority students, faculty and staff while not being on campus? And I, I take that to mean sort of, you know, the work from home and, and just the, the sort of social isolation that we all have from each other. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm going through that myself. <laughs> I think my wife and I are starting to get on each other's nerves. <laughs> we see each other more often than we're used to. Um, no, that that's a that's a really 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 good question. So, um, I did learn from the shutdown STEM event and moment in history the power of having virtual conversations. I am much more of a in-person communicator. Um, I just like to be in other people's presence. Um, but that that shutdown STEM, uh, I had a conversation with other members of the Acoustical Society of America, and we just we just gather online in a Zoom conversation, and had an open dialogue. I think it's it's it can be more challenging with this when it's virtual. I think there has to be a leader of the conversation that is going to help drive the conversation in a productive, constructive way. And so, you know, if you do have these virtual conversations, I think it's important to have uh, some topics for conversation. Uh, my colleague Lily Wong shared with me. I haven't had a chance to like do a deep dive into this link, but there's a, I think a university or a department at a university that is actually having conversations almost like book club so someone will will bring up a a topic or um, some video to watch on ted on uh, like a ted tedx talk mm -hmm. and then they'll have conversation around that so the we are in a virtual world but i think if we're creative about how to leverage connecting virtually then i think there's there is a lot of opportunity that's out there okay just check and make sure there were a couple of ones that came in about leadership and things like this. I'm glad I, I guess I asked that one because a bunch of ones that followed, including uh, one H Soba Vincent, so a colleague from, uh -huh. from BU. I know, I know. Was, What's going on, H? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll close this last one came in because this or close, but ask this one and then we can we can wrap up. Are there ways to handle a toxic student or faculty in a department, uh, especially in regard to recruitment and retainment? Again, I won't put you on the spot. Maybe again, these practices you've seen of others and stuff. Unfortunately, well, we had, you know, I set, no, go ahead. I was going to say, I set this up with, you know, there are missteps. There's things that, and there's moments for educating and, and, and calling in instead of out. I thought that was a great way. There are others, unfortunately, at times that the talks, there, there are moments you can see pretty clearly that right now this is just not going to be the right person, right individual, right attitude, at, at least at this time. Uh, for this, and I guess that, that that's what I'm setting it up as. I guess to, to be, um, say, yeah, that we are we are all either going to encounter folks like this, or we have encountered it. And what are the best ways to to handle that? I guess in a productive way for the for. Anyways, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, there's there's no real. If this is someone that um, at their core um, is biased, is bigoted, denies it. Um, does not want to uh, improve or evolve. Um, those are the most destructive individuals um, for this kind of endeavor and this effort. Um, those individuals need, need to be put in a penalty box. Um, they, they need to be, they do need to be walled off or kind of isolated. Um, there's no easy answer for that because universities, I, I, I kind of have to say this, I know Princeton, uh, the black faculty at Princeton just challenged their govern their their president and the governing body to actually penalize or fire faculty who have consistently made sort of abusive or racist comments um, because it is corrosive, it is toxic, um, and there's a I think there's a back and forth over what they're going to do because universities with tenure there's a level of protection that faculty have. And so it makes it much more difficult. I personally think that you know, if if, if you're going to get if you're going to get sued and challenged in the courts, get challenged for this one. If someone is it, it's if someone is consistently making hateful statements and racial racist statements, they need to be terminated. And if the courts, if that person is going to sue, right, to get their job back, then fight it out in the court system. I think we we have to we have to stop being risk averse to the possibility of being sued by actually not doing anything, because that's complicit with once again enabling the system and the structural barriers to continue to exist. 
So we, I, I think, I think that's one of those cases. I, I'm going to go the extreme, you know, but it requires a, a person that's in a le position of leadership with courage, and the university is going to back and support that person to say, you know, you rightfully terminated this individual because they are being disruptive, dis disruptive and destruct destructive to a learning environment, which is what a university should be. Yep. Absolutely. Um, so we're, we're coming up on our hour. I want to respect your time and everybody's time with this. Uh, I also uh, was reminded there's a, there's a great event. Um, uh, if you people look in the Q&A, there's an event later this afternoon, about an hour and a half from now it starts. Uh, University of Washington is hosting uh, on the topic of narrow values and culture defined by the most privileged. Um, and please take a look at that. There, there's a Zoom link for that in there. So you should be able to copy, paste, and save that. Um, sort of a nice complimentary uh, conversation to the discussion we've had today. So please take a look at that. Um, I think it's only right if I uh, don't want to put them on the spot, but you know, Pat, you opened us well. Uh, I've been able to watch you and see you engage and listen through this, but if maybe you want to go ahead and close us out uh, for today, um, just with, I guess, any of your thoughts or just uh, and anything on today's conversation. And just Tyrone, I just, again, uh, love you. Thank you so much. This has just been great. No, no, I'm the, I don't have so much to add. I, I love you guys so much. I'm so impressed by your caring, your generosity, and this is way outside of science. And I, I'm actually just honored to be working with you both. And Tyrone, as a, a, a lecturer of which I, I need to get your slides, I want my son to see them. <laughs> he's very activated and he's numbers based uh, like us. And I can't wait to share those slides with him. He had school this morning, but I feel like it's, you know, this is also just a continuing call to action. You know, it, when I see you and I see your wonderful family and Monica, who's a fabulous educator and so credible in this area too, you guys energize me and I just, let's all get to work and move this, you know, in a, a better direction, it, mainly because it's an injustice and there are many other reasons, but let's get to work. It, it, it's, very touching morning for me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, this has been this has been therapeutic. This has been extremely helpful for me and also for my wife because she is tired of hearing me talk about. This. <laughs> 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 been basically you for in an this. echo yeah. chamber for like the last three or four months. <laughs> we can have Monica give uh, a talk here too in this series uh, because Absolutely. I know she has an incredible voice and incredible ideas too. Yep. No, but thank you. Thank you both. And thank you all to everyone that did attend. Um, and hopefully yep. they, they take something away from this conversation. That's what to me is what's most important. They, they will, Tyrone. Trust me. <laughs> Absolutely. It's from your heart. Great. All right. Great to see you all. Maka, thanks for thanks for popping in as well. It's good yeah. to see you. <laughs> good to see you <laughs> Love you all and, and you all stay safe. You too. Stay safe. Stay masked. All right. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> bye bye.